This is Refocused. I am your host, Lindsay Gensel, and today we are talking about ADHD relationships and the emotions that come with that and all of the good stuff in between. And I am so excited to welcome Melissa Orloff back to the podcast. Again, this is my reminder to you that if this is your first time listening, welcome. We are so glad you're here. But there's so much that you've missed, and especially there's so much that you've missed with Melissa. So make sure that you go back to February 6th. That's the first of the four episodes that we are sharing throughout the month of February as we talk about ADHD and relationships. If you are unfamiliar with Melissa, she is one of the first names that I learned about when I did my little rabbit deep dive into learning all the things that I could about ADHD. She's the founder of ADHDmarriage.com, a marriage consultant, and she's also the author of two award-winning books on how ADHD impacts couples. The ADHD Effect on Marriage, which was published in 2010 and was then updated in 2020 with all of the new information. And that helps couples understand what's going on in their relationship and how they can respond to find the love that they feel they've lost. Her second book, The Couple's Guide to Thriving with ADHD, delves into particularly difficult interactions that couples may need extra help addressing. And she also blogs about ADHD and marriage, provides insight and resources for couples and for therapists over on her website, ADHDmarriage.com. She also teaches therapists how to help couples navigate challenges associated with ADHD, and her expertise has been highlighted in the New York Times, U.S. News, World Report, and many, many more, and I am so grateful to have her here on Refocused. Today, Melissa, we are going to dive into emotions, and there is a lot that goes there, the good, the bad, the ugly, and I'm curious... Where do we start? I, 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 you know, besides saying, ah! yeah, exactly. Yes. It's, <laughs> I don't know that I quite understood or really fully comprehend how much my ADHD plays a role in my emotions. So I guess that that might be a, a great place to start. That's interesting. I listened to a talk not too long ago um, about the history of ADHD and emotions. And it turns out that one of the diagnostic criteria for ADHD for a long time was actually emotional difficulty with ma- managing emotions. And that it was taken out by the APA in their wisdom at some point not that long ago. And now they're having a conversation about putting it back in. Because the research is really clear uh, that um, ADHD, uh, one of the core characteristics of ADHD is emotional dysregulation, ups and downs. Uh, you know, Ned Hallowell likes to talk about ADHD as the, the race car brain with the Ferrari, I mean, with the uh, bicycle brakes. And um, that's very much what goes on with the emotions. Very big emotions and not very good brakes on those emotions. The example that I will share from my own life is... I feel like I'm in a very healthy relationship. I've mentioned we are in couples therapy. It helps immensely. I feel very privileged and lucky that we have the time and the resources to go. That being said, even the smallest hiccup, even the smallest argument, even the smallest irritation, and I am on my way to the bedroom starting to pack my suitcase, <laughs> like planning my life. How do how do I, you know, disconnect all of these things? And you're right, it is these ups and downs. And I'm curious, do we know or can we, you know, pinpoint, are there specific emotions that tend to, you know, be at the top of the list for people with ADHD, you know, grief and anger, but what else is there? Well, it's interesting. So, you know, there are the emotions you notice and then the ones you don't. So the ones you notice are the anger, the irritability, the defensiveness, um, and, and, um, some of the sort of more intense negative emotions, um, the ones you don't notice are the intensity of shame or lack of self-esteem, the desire to escape, uh, you know, to move away from things that are, feel difficult. There's a huge, um, fight, flight, freeze thing going on for people who have ADHD. Um, and it, it just sort of, describes a lot. Their, their body goes into that high alert very quickly. And, um, and so that's part of it. Let's start with anger, because I think it's probably the one that people notice the quickest. It's the one that I think we talk about a lot when it comes to, you know, how we, you know, 
the emotions that you said we notice. It's it's easy to notice when you know how somebody responds when they're angry. It's very easy to pick out. Yes, and um, when you have had it since the emotional dysregulation is actually part of the ADHD symptomology. People have been angry or having these very fast zero to 60 immediately kinds of responses for their entire lives. So for a person with ADHD, this emotional up and down just feels like life. That's just the way it happens. And when you get into these struggling relationships, there's a lot of blame. Well, if you would just treat me better, I wouldn't be so angry or whatever. And they're not taking into account the fact that the anger is there. But what you see is very, very fast um, escalation into anger, um, immediate irritability. It's not really understandable to the other partner because the things that trigger that anger don't seem to be that big lots of times to the other partner. But what's going on underneath is that there's a trigger around often shame or fear or not feeling like you're going to, feeling like you're going to be criticized. Typically, that's the, that's the thing that's underneath the anger or underneath the defensiveness. You know, stop telling me who I am. Don't tell me what to do. You know, stop critiquing me. And Ned Hallowell actually calls it the constant critique. And it's not just partners who are doing it. It's friends. It's teachers. It's coaches. It's all those folks who've been saying, well, you could always, you could do better if you just did, tried harder or whatever. And the person with the ADHD knows, you know, so they're tired. Of, of being critiqued. So there's this very, very fast, huge emotion that comes up. And then, again, difficulty managing um, those emotions. So that's the anger. There's an interesting um, statistic. This is so pervasive. Um, I read recently that uh, 50% of uh, court-mandated anger management program attendees um, have undiagnosed ADHD, which is a huge percentage given that about 5 to 7% of the population has it. So you know, 10 times as many people who are being asked to go to these anger management issues. It's a huge, huge deal. And I'm wondering when you, you hear that, is there something that comes to your mind of like how we got to that statistic? You know, like what are we not teaching people or how are we not learning to manage some of these things that that is this, I mean, it is a crazy number. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's about teaching people per se. I think there's an awareness issue um, because even the professional community hasn't been thinking about um, emotional dysregulation and specifically anger as related to ADHD. People tend to believe that anger is environmentally produced. Something happened to me and therefore I got anger, angry. And they think because it's them looking out at the world through their own lens um, that it's rational and it fits, it, you know, everybody else would respond exactly the same way. And it turns out that the, the large amount of emotional content that the ADHD brain creates isn't like other people's amount of emotional content that's created. And, and again, it's not just anger. It could be uh, overwhelm is a really common uh, emotion that people with ADHD feel that uh, in much greater and much faster. Um, there's a word for it, actually, l emotional lability which means more emotions faster than other people get. And I'm wondering, how does the idea of what happened versus the story we're telling ourselves, how does that play into, you know, when anger comes out? Well, it's really hard in relationships because the partners have completely different experiences. So the ADHD brain and the non-ADHD brain, if you have this mixed uh, relationship, function differently, physiologically function differently. So you experience the same events differently. Um, and so there's confusion there in the first place. Like, wait, wait, that's not what I thought happened at all. And then you have this difference in emotional response and intensity of emotional response. And of course, once you get to a very intense emotion, you're back in the primitive part of the brain. You're back in the fight, fight, flight, freeze. I can never say that uh, part of the brain. Um, where it, it, you're no longer thinking logically. The blood flow actually moves away from the logical thinking part of the brain back to support the more primitive um, survival parts of the brain. So you can't logic your way out of it. You can't just say, okay, well, yeah, calm down, calm down. The person's like, no, I'm not going to calm down. No way. You know, uh, It's just you're done. And then people dig in, right? So when you're in that really lit up kind of a place – 
You dig into where you want. You're not going to give in. Thank you very much. And your partner responds the same way. You, when somebody's really, you know, yelling at you or whatever, you do the same thing. Your your brain does the same thing. It, you want to escape or you dig in or whatever. It never works for couples to have um, to have this work. So of course, it's a huge issue because here it is. It's part of ADHD. It's part of the symptomology, and it's not on the diagnostic criteria. So people don't know that. And uh, there's a lot of blame that goes around, a lot of hard feelings, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. It's very difficult to manage. We talk about anger and we talk about the connection with critiques. And you mentioned the statistic, and I'm hoping you can pull it back up, about women and the number of times that uh, an undiagnosed uh, – you mentioned a statistic about the number of times a a girl is critiqued in life. Mm. And can, can we go back to that for just one yeah, second? Yeah, it's not, it's not gender specific. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's a kid uh, before the age of 12 um, receives uh, about 20,000 additional critiques if they have ADHD than if they don't, uh, their peers who don't. So it's a huge, huge issue. And one of the underpinnings, I know where you're going with this, one of the underpinnings of the anger, uh, anger is sort of this over like, doesn't feel good, ah, emotion, but underneath it, there's something more nuanced. And lots of times underneath it for ADHD is the shame or low self-esteem or, or not feeling like you're going to be able to handle whatever the situation is. I mentioned my partner is very A to Z. I'm very, I get to Z, but how I get there is going to look different every single time. And one of the things that we've had to work on communicating is when I want help and when I don't want help and what unsolicited advice will do to me, which is it does make me angry because all of a sudden it kind of probably brings back these memories of feeling like I'm not capable of doing something or that the way I do something is wrong because it's not quote unquote the right way. And <laughs> I, I have to imagine that communication in this is probably one of the, the, toughest parts to add in because no one wants to communicate calmly when you're angry. Well, and, and even before you get angry, what you're talking about is really... Setting um, boundaries, kind of. Well, uh, no, I was actually going to go in a different direction. Okay. I mean, setting boundaries is really important, and we, we can talk about that. But um, partners think they're helping. Let me help you with this. The other, The rest of that sentence when you have ADHD is because you can't do it yourself right? Uh, Oh, why don't you sort the laundry this way? The rest of the sentence is because you're not sorting it the way I like. Uh, And and so all of these quote unquote helpful things really trigger people with ADHD. And it's confusing for the other folks. They're trying to do their best, even though once you say to them, like I say this all the time to non-ADHD partners, okay, let's think about what you're really saying here. You say, oh, that's not a critique. I'm just helping out. I'm going, yeah, no, it is a critique. Absolutely. It's a critique. So let's Let's, uh, you know, actually look it in the eye and call it what it is, which is your partner's not doing what you expect or want, and you want to change that. And they hear that loud and clear. And so that's part of what triggers that sensitivity. So when you talk about, you know, having this communication around when you need help or when you don't, one way to do that is to make the relationship be open and trustworthy enough so that the time that you get help is when you ask for it. Not when your partner is critiquing like, oh, well, they could use help right now. You don't want that. You want it when you ask for it, you know you could need it for whatever the assistance is. And at that point, the partner willingly jumps in to do you know, whatever the thing is you're asking. Do you find that people with ADHD who come to you and who are having these conversations have a hard time going back to some of those triggering moments and explaining that to their partners? Because I think for me, a lot of the stuff that really shaped who I am right now and and not in a good way is stuff that I have packed away in boxes and I've taped up like double time (laughs) and I have thrown into the, you know, the, the warehouse in the back of my brain. And it's not until I connect the dots where I go, oh, that's what that is. But it's not fun to revisit that stuff. No, it's not. And I would say in general, so one of the benefits of having ADHD is a very present moment focus. 
and I and I try to work with couples to say, look, let's just take the, most of the past. You can't take it all, but let's take most of the past and put it as we did the best we could do, but we didn't really know what was going on, and start fresh as best you can. There will be things that you bring forward, the shame, um, interactions that trigger one or the other of you, and, an anger or resentment, a feeling that you bring forward. But deal with that in the present moment as it's showing up for you right now, rather than trying to understand what was happening in the past. Because what was happening in the past was undiagnosed ADHD, symptomatic behaviors, and not particularly nuanced or good responses to those behaviors because neither one of you knew what was going on. And you can sort of just all lump it together. Um, so if you focus in on what's going on right now, then you can use the tools, you can use more empathy and understanding to start changing things that make sense for you moving into the future. From where we are right now, does it make sense to talk about shame? Because I kind of feel like shame and anger tie together in, in some ways, especially with how we respond to things. They do, for sure. Um, the wells of shame are very deep for most adults who have ADHD. If they don't feel they have much shame, they probably just haven't addressed it yet, quite frankly, just because it's hard not to walk away from that experience that those kids have. Um, with people, teachers, parents, coaches, people that they wanted to trust um, and who inadvertently lots of times gave these critical messages to them. Um, so it's a place of great hurt and trauma, actually. Um, and one of the things that is helpful for adults with ADHD is to actually name it as such. Yes, there's a great deal of shame and embarrassment Yes, it is, as Freud says, this is a master emotion. It is an emotion that impacts everything else. What you choose to respond to, what you choose to escape from, how you respond to something, all of that stuff is impacted by shame. You can go to therapy, particularly cognitive behavioral therapy, to try to address feelings of shame, um, but having it be sort of out on the table is really hard, but also really useful. If you can say, look, that starts to feel, hey, Mr. Partner or Mrs. Partner or whomever, however you want to genderize it, uh, if that's a word, um, y the, uh, I'm starting to feel shame or I'm starting to feel these negative emotions. I need to step back and, and recalibrate for a while. If you can get to a place where you're capable of doing that, the relationship and the interactions in that relationship will be improved really hard to get there because of the nature of shame. You don't want to name it when you're feeling it because you're ashamed of it, right? So it, it takes a good deal of work and bravery and courage to be able to actually start to make it more visible to yourself and to a partner. Um, it's a huge factor in defensiveness. It's uh, really often behind defensiveness. Now, it's not just on the ADHD partner. Also, the other partner has a role to play. Being much more sensitive to what they're actually saying to their partner between the lines is really helpful. Um, being more compassionate about how hard it is to live with that shame uh, and to manage it uh, and, and get around it as best as possible. Um, to make the responses when shame or other things are brought forward um, be positive and uh, rewarding rather than punishing or, um, you know, cutting down a partner or whatever. And, and there's a lot of, on the non-ADHD partner side, there's a lot of resentment and other things that are going on. So those aren't always easy to access either. I'm wondering if you could help paint a picture of how shame can come out for a person with ADHD, because I can think of my own experience and it, it comes out in the way that you think it would, like em embarrassment and, you know, you pulling away and, and hiding. But I also have, you know, read stuff where shame can produce almost like love bombing behavior. <laughs> and so it feels like it's both ends of the spectrum and... I, I think there are a lot of people who are, you know, processing shame and maybe don't even realize that that's what's happening. Yeah, I haven't seen too much of the love bombing behavior, to be honest with you, because typically it's so difficult to, re to engage with shame that there's an escape mechanism going on. Um, defensiveness is one of the most common um, once, you know, you say something and your partner's like, who made you the boss of me? And then that's sort of the end of that. Um, another actually, uh, way that it comes up is in cover-ups and lying. 
Um, and you get a lot of, I mean, I, I give an a example in my course about a man who told his, and agreed, and told his partner, I'm not going to use chewing tobacco anymore. And then he went out and he bought some chewing back tobacco on an impulsivity thing. You know, he just saw it. And like, oh, I'll get some of that. And then he realized what he had done, so he hid it in his drawer. And she found it, and she got furious with him. And, of course, that was a shame thing. Like, oh, oops, I made a mistake again. I better hide it. You know, if he had gone to her and said, okay, you might see this chewing tobacco in the trash. That's because I bought it impulsively. And now I'm tossing it out because I didn't really mean to do that, and we had this agreement. She would have been fine. It was the fact that he hid it that made the interaction so negative. And what's behind that? And I, I asked that's that. That's the shame. Well, and I, yes, I asked that. It, like, My partner, John, doesn't think I'm a good liar, but I think I'm a pretty good liar <laughs> because I spent my entire life covering up little white lies. Yeah. Because it is shame. It's uh, – even, you know, like you make plans with someone and you don't put it on your calendar and you forget. So then you lie about traffic or you lie about a flat tire or whatever it is because somewhere along the line you made a mistake and someone made you feel a certain way about it. And so then the rest of your life now is spent like in this balance of white lies. And, and if you just yeah. came forward and said, hey, I bought this chewing tobacco I made a mistake. I don't want to do this, but it was, you know, this impulsivity and – I mean, in a sense, it also is an addiction. And so you have to kind of clear the air. Yeah, you do. And and it's, it's sometimes it's small things and sometimes it's really big things. Right. Uh, I had a man who um, lost his job because he had difficulty with the paperwork and the organization stuff. So directly re related to his ADHD executive function issues. Then he went and got another job, same title, lost that one for the exact same reason. Then he went and got another job, lost that one for the exact same reason. And by the third time uh, that he had lost it, he ended up pretending that he still had his job and going out of the house in the morning and then coming back at the right time. His wife figured it out because she saw his job posted in a newsletter. Uh, and, and it's just, it's, it makes you want to cry when you hear stories about that. But there was so much shame about that. And of course, the obvious answer to that is for him to get executive uh, function training so that he can, in fact, not have that problem again in the future. But he also didn't want to deal with the fact that he had these problems. And that was part of the shame as well. So as they say, it's a master emotion. It keeps you from doing things that make logical sense but which emotionally you just can't quite face because it triggers that shame. Is it possible to move past shame? Yes, it is. It's hard. I mean, because this is many, many, many years of people telling you, you just, you have this voice on your shoulder going, ah, ah, see, you did it again, you know, and you have to really fight that and replace that story with something else. And I think it's a multi-prong approach. First of all, getting better management of the ADHD so that you make mistakes less often or you're more reliable is another way to think about it. Um, so that's one part of it. And another part of that is probably cognitive behavioral therapy, again, which works specifically on identifying the stories that hurt you and giving you replacement stories that you can use when you start to fall into those feelings again. And I'd say the third area is making sure your partner is well aware of it so that they're not triggering it by mistake. Uh, I mean, sometimes they're going to trigger it anyway, but so that they're not just sort of stumbling into that shame and triggering you. And, um, uh, you know, this is, I talked before about imbalances of power and the parent-child thing. This is one of the problems with parent-child is that that parent figure regularly makes the ADHD partner feel um, less than. You mentioned when we started talking about shame and, and looking back at kind of our lives when maybe there was a point where an adult let us down. And it, it made me realize this moment that I, I actually, I had a realization. It was actually at the International Conference on ADHD in Dallas just in November. And I had an incident happen in middle school where a couple of my classmates made the We Hate Lindsay Gensel petition and oh. went around the school and had everyone sign it. And then they delivered it to my locker at the end of the day. Like, I mean, like in my mind, it was like trumpets were blaring and whatnot. And I didn't tell anyone. I was so embarrassed. I didn't go home and tell my mom. I didn't go home and tell my dad. In fact, I didn't tell my mom until a few years ago. I think my sister found out like 
on like one of the latest episodes of the podcast that came out after <laughs> I had this realization because I had this moment at the conference where I had this kind of the dots connecting where I thought, I volunteer in a school, so I hear so much. Mm -hmm. And I'm only there for four hours a week. And in my head, I'm going, there's no way that in that school there was not one adult who knew, they knew what was going on or they had heard rumblings of it and not one person stepped in. And I get it. It's like, you know, it was like probably 1998. It was, you know, well, let's say a different time. But in my head, it was that moment of realizing like, I got let down there and I let that moment where kids did something cruel and kids do cruel things because we yeah. don't know better. But again, you go back and you think of all the things that teachers hear on a day-to-day -day basis and not one person like pulled me aside or called my parents. And I would like to believe that maybe they didn't know, but I also have a really hard time believing that, you know? So it is, it's just, it, there's so much there. I'm so sorry that happened well, to you. you. That's you really know, horrible. Yeah, it, it, it was <laughs> really awful. horrible. And again, I go back to kind of the things that you tuck away in boxes and, and pack up. But it's hard to move on from something when you are not the one who has any control over it. Well, I didn't do anything. Right. And if you think about those 20,000 injuries before the age of 12... Uh, it's not just one or two right. adults. It's many, many of the other people in the lives of that child. Um, it's hugely traumatic. And I'm not surprised at all that you're packing it away in boxes <laughs> because I sure would too. Yeah. I mean, it would be just really hard to look at that. And you can know rationally that you didn't, you couldn't control it, you weren't in charge of it, but that doesn't make it feel any better. No, it doesn't. And, uh, you know, the way the brain works is when you ruminate on those kinds of things, you actually relive them. And that is one of the reasons why I say to people, hey, can you cut, like, the past? Let's just not think about the past until it actually is intruding on the present moment, um, which that still might because that sounds like a very traumatic um, episode for you and stand, a standout episode. I mean, I can't imagine the pain. That, that felt. I actually think in the moment I I locked a lot of it away, mm -hmm. you know, and I think now I'm looking back and going, what else did I lock away? You know, if I could put that away, what else was there? And I'm glad you said the word rumination because it's one of the first things that I learned about after I was diagnosed where I went, oh, this is what I have been doing for so long. This feeling of I'm going to sit and think about this thing for as long as possible, but never really telling myself that the outcome's not going to change. Well, and as human beings, one of the drives that we have is to create a story that makes sense of things. And, and I think the story that makes sense of things in that one is pretty straightforward. You had ADHD. You got treated the way people with ADHD got treated. You don't know. You didn't know about it at the time. You had no coping strategies for it other than to lock it away. And you can't do anything about it. You did the best you could do as that child and as a young adult and et cetera. And so just to sort of use that as the story without having to do any other look at it can be very freeing. Otherwise, you're just mucking around. It. And as you say, it's not going to change what happened. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't grieve it. Right. And there is a lot of grief. When people get diagnosed with ADHD, one of the things they say is, wow, now finally I have an explanation. And the next thing they say often is, I wish I had known about this 20 years ago because my life would have been completely different. And they're right. It might well have been very different, but they didn't know. And many people didn't know 20 years ago. For that matter, many people don't know now. So, yeah, the, the grief that comes with it, and I feel like that's a great segue to it because it is astronomical. And I feel it all the time as somebody who is, you know, I've mentioned very career driven. And I look back at failing out of college twice and this undiagnosed ADHD that was sitting there and these dopamine trips I was chasing around campus, you know, not going to class and, and doing all of these things. And it is a challenge every day to stay on course. Yeah. But a part of my path forward is working through the grief of that time and that energy and that opportunity that's lost. And I think the more people who are being diagnosed later in life, it's just going to continue to grow because we are losing out on things because of these unknowns. You know, people didn't know and they still don't know. And there are still people out there. I see them in the comments all the time who are saying <laughs> ADHD isn't real. This isn't, this isn't a thing. This is just your excuse to be lazy. 
I have to say, I am the least lazy person I have ever met. I don't know how to be lazy. So when you say that to somebody who has ADHD, it's like, it just proves you have no idea what you're talking about. Right. And actually, I see that all the time. I see the people that I know with ADHD are definitely not lazy, almost without exception. Yeah. Because they have all this work to do to manage their lives to keep them on track, <laughs> as you say. You know, the grief is interesting. There's grief about the past. And actually, in a couple, both partners experience that grief. They, f they experience the, what would our relationship have been like if we had known what was happening at the point at which, for example, we went from that hyper-focused courtship into the regular life and weren't so confused by it and knew how to handle it. Um, and, and I had all these dreams of what my relationship would be like, and it's turned out to be completely different. Uh, than I thought. And so there's grieving over that. And then there's grieving over what could the ADHD person have accomplished or could they have held their job or whatever it is. So there's a lot of stuff in the past. There's also grief in the present moment, which is why is it so hard? Why does it have to be so hard? Every day I can't let up. Uh, you know, my life is ready to fall apart if I do. Um, and how unfair that feels. And so there's just dealing with that also, which is just sort of the reality of having ADHD. ADHD has been demonstrated over and over and over again to be a true challenge in one's life across almost every domain of that life. And, and it, does, it isn't fair. It's, you know, it was, you got it from your parents, most likely, not all the time. And that's just the way it is. What would be your suggestion to somebody with ADHD who's listening to this and is hearing us talk about the emotions and is feeling like some of the things that they do in life is, is a manifestation of them responding to these feelings. And, and maybe it's coming out in a way that they don't like, that they're getting angry because they're getting critiqued and they don't know how to communicate that. Is there a, a starting point? Is there a, a good way to move forward that is helping them heal the past, but also working towards like a better future. Yes, yeah, so I would separate out anger from other emotions, anxiety, depression we haven't talked about, but those right. are really common as well. Um, there's uh, quite a bit of work right now on the anger and what you do with the anger. And um, it turns out that the, these big emotions and particularly the anger emotions um, uh, move, they, they depend upon, um, the biology of the brain, depending upon what version you have and which areas of the brain um, are impacted specifically for you, one of the options, one of the best options is actually medication. Um, and the medications are different classes of medications that work um, across these different brain areas uh, that work differently. So you have to figure out which one is the best one for you. But from, for some people with ADHD, that's the first place to go is to talk to a doctor about the anger management through medications because if it works for you, it's life-changing, completely life-changing, um, and, and really sets you on a completely new path. Um, with the other emotions, the shame and some of the other issues that are going on, um, that is more likely to be dealt with through therapy also by being open with your partner about it and getting co-educated on it. So a partner uh, who's married to somebody or partnered with somebody who has ADHD, who, uh, who does not acknowledge the importance of that ADHD um, and also to their own responses is really hard to work with. So getting um, the other partner aware that this is not intentional. This is not that the partner is a good person or a bad person. It has to do with symptoms and to learn much more about it is a good first step. Um, and then a professional therapist who understands ADHD. One of the issues is a lot of therapists don't understand ADHD and particularly in couples therapy, that's a problem because they tend to side with a non-ADHD partner say, oh, well, you should just try this. And why can't you do that? What's wrong with you? And it goes really bad uh, very fast. So you have to find somebody who's ADHD savvy. I want to talk about that, but I'm going to save that for our fourth and final episode as we dive into ADHD and relationships throughout the month of February. So I'm going to write that down. We're going to talk about therapists and ADHD and what you should be looking for. And also, I'm curious to know, like, the changes you've seen and if if more therapists are adding ADHD into their specialty. So we will get to that on our fourth and final episode 
of Refocused. This is a conversation that we're having. There's four of them. You can go back and listen to number one, number two. This was number three. And next week, we'll have number four with Melissa Orlov. She is the founder of ADHDmarriage.com. She's also a marriage consultant and the author of two award-winning books on how ADHD impacts couples. And if you have not been to her website, ADHDmarriage.com, I highly, highly recommend heading over there and checking it out. She has a bunch of stuff that will, oh gosh, provide you so many uh, insights and resources. And one of the things that I am really, really uh, pushing you to check out are the couple seminars that she does. She does two to three a year. They're live via Zoom. They've helped out so many couples improve their ADHD impacted relationships. And the amazing news is that if you can't attend one of the live versions, there is a self-study version available through her website. So that is ADHDmarriage.com.